now take you into a service already in progress where Pastor Ashish exhorts the congregation and leads them in making the declaration. Right after this is a life changing message for you. Hold your Bible high up in the air. Say it out loud with me. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am an absolute surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. We are doing a series on seven spices. And we are using 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 11 as our text for this entire series. So let's go there and read it together. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Peter writes, he says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we've read this passage now uh, several times now. And uh, what we see here, Peter is telling us, he's saying, I want you to add to your faith. And he lists seven ingredients. So it's not enough for us to have faith in Jesus and say, you know, okay, I have faith, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But we need to add to our faith, these seven things. And he says, if you add these seven things to your faith, he says, then you will be fruitful in your walk with God. And you'll also ensure that you will not stumble or fall in your walk with God. You're going to have a stable, strong, steady walk with God. And he says, if you don't add these things, then you're like somebody who is short-sighted. You're, you're, you're very temporal in your vision. Rather than looking at things from an eternal perspective, very short-sighted, you cannot see far ahead. And also, it's possible that you may have a tendency to go back. You've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your old sins. And you have a tendency to go back to your old way. So it's so important for us as believers who have our faith in Jesus to add to our faith these seven things. And examining each one of them in depth, trying to understand how these things apply to us as believers. How do they apply to us as, as Christians? We saw the first one, virtue. Add to your faith, virtue, which means good character. The second one we saw last Sunday, add to your faith, knowledge, or spiritual understanding. Add to it. Grow in the knowledge of the Lord. This morning, we want to look at the third one, which is self-control. Or the King James would use the word temperance. Or some of the modern translations would use the word discipline. So it all means the same thing. He says, add to your faith... Temperance, self-control, discipline. You need that for your faith, for your walk with God. And really what we are talking about is having control or mastery over our desires, our emotions, our appetites, our inclinations. He says this is important. You need to develop this in your life so that you can have a fruitful life in God, a strong, stable, steady walk with God. Add discipline. To your life. Now, this is the same word that's used in Galatians chapter 5. So if you'll go with me there, and maybe some of you know this verse. 
by heart. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23. Paul writes here, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Same Greek word, which means temperance. He's saying, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is discipline, is temperance. So the, the point that we must understand is that the Holy Spirit helps us develop this in our lives. It's a fruit of the Spirit. A produce of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Discipline. So it's not just all about me trying to, you know, control myself. But it's a fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at, is at work in you and me. Developing this characteristic of discipline. Self-control. Temperance, so to speak. Why is this so important? Let's go to the book of Proverbs and look at two scriptures from the book of Proverbs. Why is discipline, self-control or self-governing ability, why is that so important? In Proverbs 16 and verse 32, Solomon says here, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. So it's a person who has rule over his own spirit. He has self-governing ability, self-control, discipline, mastery over his own self. He is better than somebody who can conquer cities, who can do great things, great accomplishments. But why is that? Why would there be greater value on self-governing than on great conquests? I think you find some answer to that over in Proverbs chapter Proverbs 25 and verse 28, he says here, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. If you don't have rule over your own spirit, you have, don't have the self-governing, self-discipline, self-control over your own life, then he says you're like a city that is without walls, meaning there is no defense, no protection. The city can be conquered, can be taken over anytime. So without this self-discipline or self-control, I am vulnerable to anything that can come and hold me hostage, can, that can come and hold me captive. So while I may be able to conquer cities, if I do not have self-control, I am very vulnerable. Amen? I mean, think of, and I'm not saying everybody who does great things is, is like this, but think of people who have great accomplishments, but have lacked self-control in their lives. I mean, some rock stars, I mean, they have great fame, great name, made millions upon millions. But when they die, they die in great debts. And you say, like, this doesn't add up. What was missing? Self-governing ability, discipline. So although they were able to conquer cities, they themselves were so open, so vulnerable, that they were held hostage or captive to so many things that ruined their lives. So discipline is so important for us. And the, Peter says, you've got to add discipline to your walk of faith. I want to talk to us about four areas of discipline. And uh, then just talk to us on how to develop discipline in our lives. You know, we are tripart beings. Spirit, soul, and body. Every person is a tripart being. You have a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. The spirit is that part of you that connects with God, that, that understands and explores and experiences the spiritual realm. The soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, the intellectual part, the, the psyche part of you. And the body is the outer man. And we must develop discipline in all these three realms. They're all inter very in interconnected. They affect one another. And we must develop discipline in all these three realms. So the first area of discipline is to develop discipline uh, in our inner man, our spirit man. There are several scriptures we can use here, and I just want to quickly run through some here. In Ephesians 3.16, Paul says, I want you to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in your inner man. Be strengthened with power by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. In other words, put on spiritual muscle. You know, your inner man is very much like your outer man. Your inner man has eyes. The spirit man has eyes and ears and hands and feet and so on. Very much parallel. 
And so Paul is saying, I want you to strengthen your inner man. Build spiritual strength in your inner man, your spirit man. And later on in the same epistle in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So you be strong. See, God is strong. There's no lack of power on his part. But you be strong in him. He is the power source. But that power needs to come into your life. So you be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's got the might, but you need the power. You need that power in you. So Paul is saying, I want you to develop spiritual strength, but that comes from God. And all of us know to do this, there are no shortcuts. The way we do this is what the Bible tells us in Isaiah 40 verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Unfortunately, when it comes to these things, there are no drive throughs There are no McDonald's. You know, there are no vending machines. Quick. It doesn't say those who drive through the presence of the Lord shall renew their strength. It says they that wait upon the Lord. Unfortunately, we have this drive through mentality, this vending machine mentality, even when it comes to spiritual things. Pastor, tell me, which button can I push to get this power can that I need in my life? You know, where's the fastest spiritual drive through? Is it beside Gabriel or is it Michael? Or who? No, the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And so it takes a certain amount of spiritual discipline for you and me to come regularly before God, just to wait upon Him so that we can become strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That requires discipline. Amen? And that's the only way. There is no shortcut. I mean, uh, nobody can do that for you. You have to write your own history with God. No one else can do that. A second area of discipline that you and I must develop is in develop discipline in our mind. In the thoughts we think and what we feed our mind with. That's the soulish part of us. Our mind, our will, our emotions. You know, God designed our mind. God gave us our mind to use. And so the mind is really a good thing. It's meant to be used for the glory of God. It's not a bad thing. Your intellect, your ability to think and reason and and, and ponder and and analyze and logic, all that is God designed. It's not wrong. But it has to be disciplined. It has to be trained to think the way God wants us to think. So God teaches us in his word in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Paul writes, he says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure. Are you all with me so far? But God doesn't want us to stop there. He's challenging us to think like him. And I think that's a bigger bridge to cross. When God says, I want you to think like me. You know, look at scriptures like this in Philippians 2, 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. And of course, the context there is about meekness and humility. But the point that God is getting across to you and me is he says, I want you to have the same mind, the same mindset, the same way of looking at things as Jesus does. And it's repeated over in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16. Where he, you know, Paul is talking about what the work of the Holy Spirit in helping us understand the mysteries of God. And he concludes that chapter in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. He says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Meaning as believers, we have access to the thoughts and the ways of God. We have the mind of Christ. So really as believers, we are called to think like Christ. Amen? And that's what the renewed mind is all about. See, as believers, we are supposed to walk with a renewed mind. In Romans 12, verse 2, we know that scripture says, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be renewed in your thinking. Be renewed in your mind. What is renewed thinking? It simply is that I discard my ways and my thoughts and take on God's ways and God's thoughts. And that's the invitation given in Isaiah 55. He says, let the wicked man 
forsake his ways. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, come to me. For my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But I'm sending my word to you. The essence of that passage is, get rid of your own ways, get rid of your own thoughts, take on my ways, my thoughts. That's the renewed mind. And God is calling every believer to have a renewed mind. Discipline your mind to think as Christ would think, as God would see it, God's ways and God's thoughts. Are you all with me so far? Now, what is the renewed mind? Let's talk about this. You know, a renewed mind is a mind that's able to sleep in the middle of a storm. And only the storm in which you can sleep in, you can conquer. Let me try this out. A renewed mind is a mind that can sleep in the middle of a storm. And only the storm that you can sleep in, you can conquer. Jesus was with his disciples in a boat. And they were going across a lake and a storm came. And it was so fierce. That, you know, the, the, sh- the boat was filling up with water. And, and, and you know, they could just see the, the water level rising and the boat going lower and lower. And the winds and the waves really rough. And there was Jesus fast asleep. Now, some people say he was sleeping because he was tired. But I can tell you, no matter how tired you are, if you are in that middle of a storm like that, you're not going to sleep. So Jesus was not sleeping because he was tired. I think he was sleeping because he had peace inside him. And I can just imagine Peter in the middle of this thing. And he's in the boat. The waves are going there. Peter's looking at that side. There are huge waves, storm. He turns and looks at Jesus fast asleep. And he t- looks at that side. Big wave, storm, looks at Jesus fast asleep. Saying like, this just doesn't add up. He he probably was the first one to go and wake Jesus up and say, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to sink. But Jesus didn't wake up and say, oh my God, I didn't know there was a storm. He didn't think like that. He walked in the peace of God. So he comes to the front of the ship and he calms the storm. See, only the storm in which you can sleep in, you can conquer. But it takes the mind of Christ to be able to sleep in the middle of a storm. Amen. The natural mind reacts, sees the waves, the winds, and and acts like Peter and says, Wow, this is too much. We're going to sink. But the mind of Christ is, I know we're going to go through this. I know who's in control. The Bible says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace. His mind that is stayed on you. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. How can you be in perfect peace? Because my mind is not on the storm. My mind is on the one above the storm. So we must discipline our minds. And in the middle of a storm, not to put our minds on the storm, but on the one greater than the storm. That's the mind of Christ. Another thing about the renewed mind is this. You see, I believe God wants us to use our intellect. He wants us to use our understanding. He wants to use our reasoning. But I also believe that when it comes to walking with God... We must give up our right to understand. You understand whatever God allows you to understand, but you also must give up your right to understand. So why? Because there are a lot of things that God wants you to experience and walk in, which your mind will not understand. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says this, that you know when we pray and give all our anxieties to God, He gives us peace which is beyond understanding. But to walk in the kind of peace, that God kind of peace... You have to give up your right to understand because it is a peace that is beyond understanding. But you and I sit down there and say, God, I want you to give me an answer. Why is this storm happening in my life? Why is there water in my boat? God, why are you not stopping? The... And we ask all the whys and the hows and the whens. We want demand an explanation. And God says, if you want to walk in peace that passes understanding, you've got to give up your right to understand. How many of you want to follow God in His ways? We all want to follow God. But the Bible says in Romans 11, 33, his ways are beyond understanding. His ways are beyond understanding. You, are, you said you want to follow his ways, but his ways are beyond understanding. So sometimes God will lead you in ways that you can't understand. Because his ways are beyond understanding. So if you want to follow his ways, you give up your right to understand. Amen? I know, I know something like, this is not the message I want to hear. You give up your right to understand because sometimes he says, just follow me. There are times when you understand. God says, take a right turn. And you know, the reason he told you to take a right turn was because it was a T-junction. And that makes perfect sense. But sometimes you come to a signal and God says, take a right turn. And you say, but why must I take a right turn? Why can't I go straight or go left? 
God says, follow me. My ways are beyond understanding. So you make a right turn. People ask you, why did you make a right turn? I don't know. I just know. God told me to take a right turn. I'm doing it. The Bible says that his, we, we walk with a joy that is uh, inexpressible and full of glory. First Peter 1, I think it's verse 7. So here's a joy. You know you have it, but you can't express it. So what kind of joy is it? It's the God kind of joy. The joy that is inexpressible. I mean, it's beyond our ability to express. That's the kind of joy we call to walk in. It's a peace that's beyond understanding. It's ways beyond understanding. It's a joy that I can't express, but I enjoy it. I, I have it. So to walk with a renewed mind, sometimes we have to give up our right to understand. And God is calling us to discipline our minds to walk like that. So that way, when some calamity comes, you don't react the way a normal person would get. Oh my God, no. You're able to look at it and say, my God's bigger than this. See, another thing that we must discipline ourselves is, I cannot allow any thought to reside in my mind which would not be allowed in God's mind. I cannot allow any thought in my mind which would not be allowed in God's mind. Do you think when God sees your situation, he says, oh my God, this is the end of the world. I don't think he thinks like that. But then why are you and I thinking like that? We see the, the difficulty of our situation. We think, oh, this is the end of it. You cannot allow in your mind a thought that would not be allowed in the mind of God. Because God has invited you to put on the mind of Christ. Amen? And it's not going to be automatic for any of us. Because we were raised with a carnal mind. And the Bible says the carnal mind is enmity with God. So we are called we are to, to train ourselves to develop a spiritual mind. A renewed mind. To put on the mind of Christ. To pursue uh, things that sometimes we can't understand. To experience a peace that's beyond understanding. To walk in a joy that's inexpressible. Uh, to follow God in ways that, that are beyond understanding. Got to discipline our mind to do that. A third area that we must discipline ourselves is in the taking care of our bodies. You know, we believe that our body is the temple of God. First Corinthians 6, 19, Paul says, don't you know that your body is the temple of God? I mean, this is God's temple. And uh, we must take responsibility of disciplining our bodies discipline in your body. Do you know that Jesus paid the same price to redeem your spirit and your soul and your body? He shed his blood. In 1 Corinthians 6.20 Paul says, glorify God in your spirit and in your body which are God's. You have been bought with a price. He says, glorify God in your spirit and in your body which are God's. God bought you spirit, soul and body with the same price. But sometimes we make the mistake you know, we just emphasize the spirit And sometimes your spirit wants to go and your body can't follow. Because it's tired, it's weary, it's broken down. And God wants to get you to do something and your body is not ready for it. So I believe we have to take responsibility about these temples, these bodies. Our bodies which are the temple of God. And we need to develop discipline in that area as well. And discipline simply would mean that we develop good eating habits, exercise and rest habits. Amen? Say, Pastor, I came to church, not to the clinic. It's okay. I believe God wants us to be responsible in taking care of our bodies. Discipline in this area as well. Eat right. Exercise often. Rest well. On my laptop, I have a a screensaver that I've just put together. And it it just pops up different motivational images with motivational sayings. And just keeps me inspired. One of them is this that says, stay fit. And I have the picture of uh, Usain Bolt over there. He says, one day maybe I'll be like him. I don't know, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I just like, this is, this is how good you can get, you know. But then I have a line that says, your greatest work may still be ahead of you. Do not let poor health or age keep you from fulfilling it. Amen. So we all like to say the best is yet to come. God has greater things in the future. Wow, wonderful things. If you really believe that your greatest work is ahead of you, you better make sure your body is in good shape when that comes. 
There's no point, you know, when you say, wow, now the anointing has come and the glory of God's come and your body says, I need to go to hospital. So sad. The time for your greatest work has come and your body needs to be admitted. You're not ready. So what must you do? Develop discipline. Make sure you're ready. You take care of your body. You eat right. You exercise. You do rest well so that when the time comes for you to do your greatest work, you are ready, spirit, soul, and body. Amen? So it requires discipline to take care of body. And you know, just, just, you know, we are all intelligent people. We are urban people. We have had good education and so on. And you know, a lot of health problems that you and I face can actually be avoided if we just ate right, exercised, and gave ourselves enough rest. Simple as that. A lot of health problems. You know. I'm, not, I'm not putting anybody down, please. But just think of it, you know. You got backache. But, you know, and let me say, okay, pastor, pray for me. Cast the devil out of me. But sometimes you don't need to blame the devil. Ask simple questions. Are you drinking enough water? So why? Because you are 75% water and you need to keep your body hydrated. And over time, if you do not do that, then you will come up with these kinds of problems. So no devil to cast out. Just drink a lot of water. Finished. And stretch regularly. Right? And then, you know, think of all the kind of good foods we eat. All the riches biryanis. I mean, it's okay once in a while, the biryani and the kebab and... Or did the burgers, how McDonald's has invaded our lives, man. And, you know, and pizza. And all. I mean, it's okay to enjoy. I'm not saying it's wrong. But, you know, if you're on a steady diet of McDonald's, or you're on a steady diet of biryani and, you know, butter chicken and butter naan, and, and then you say, I need an angioplasty, or I pass it, please pray for me. No, what have you been eating all these days? Please cast the devil out. He's, he's attacking my heart. Just change your diet. You know, it's, and we, we spiritualize our problems when a lot of it just required discipline in our eating habits, in our exercise, in our rest. That's all. Amen? You know, right after service, we have uh, somebody subscribing to the gym here. No, it's, no, it's okay. no. The point is, we must discipline our bodies and, 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 and be responsible in this area as well. If you really believe that your body is the temple of God, you need to take care of it. Be ready for the, for the greatest assignment that God has ahead of you. Simple things. I mean, this, this is not difficult to understand. That you need to eat right, exercise, discipline your body. And I look at it this way. You know, what price do you want to pay? Are you willing to sacrifice 30 minutes four or five, di- five days a week to exercise? Or are you so busy making money that you don't have this time to, you know, don't have 30 minutes to exercise, but you're so busy making money, 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 that somewhere when you're about 40 or 50, somewhere around that time, you will end up, you know, 30, 60, 90 days on bed, open heart surgery, spending three lakhs, and whatever. I mean, what do you want? 30 minutes a day is fine doesn't cost you anything. And you can put all that three lakhs offering for the church. <laughs> we can do something good with it. Amen? I mean, it just, just takes some time every day or regularly. I know sometimes we travel and there are sometimes you can't do it. But, but just generally, it's a, it's a discipline in your life. Exercise regularly. Eat. Watch what you eat. I mean, you have the biryani on Sunday. Then please make sure don't eat too much biryani the rest of the week or you know, you got to control what you eat. Be careful. Eat healthy and, and take care of it. Okay, enough said. For, that was, and the last area, we need discipline in using our resources. It's your time, your money, your talents. Discipline in this area as well. You know, God wants to be glorified through this. He entrusts us with resources, with time, with money, with talents. He's given to each one of us differently, but he expects all of us to be good stewards of it. And it requires discipline to be a good steward of these resources. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, Paul writes, he says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He says, I want you to walk very carefully, watchfully. Don't walk along foolishly. 
But be wise, be smart. Because, you know, you're living in difficult times. And so, redeem your time. You make careful use of your time. Be a good steward of the resources God has given to you. And this requires discipline. Let me just quickly move on to just share some thoughts here on, you know, how do we develop discipline in our lives? And I'm just sharing some thoughts here. The first one is, I think we need to think differently. To be disciplined people, we need to think differently. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Everything is lawful. I mean, I can eat as much pizza as I want to eat. Nobody's, you know, God is not going to send fire and brimstone. All things are lawful for me. But Paul says, it's not about whether I'm allowed to do it. That's not the issue. The question is, is it helpful? He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I will not let anything control me. So the issue is not whether I'm allowed to do it. The issue is, will it end up controlling me? So you see, we have to think differently. It's not about whether I'm allowed to do it. The question is, is it helpful for me? Will it dominate me? Or will I be able to control it? So to develop discipline, we need to think from that perspective. And I want to challenge you and me that sometimes in some areas of our lives, in order to have discipline, we must be willing to accept delayed gratification, or in some cases even denied gratification, in order to reach out for something more valuable. Amen? So I can, you know, I can just enjoy and eat and say, you know, God has blessed me to eat as much as I want to now and pay later. Or I can say, look, I will be very careful in what I eat. So I'm denying my gratification of certain kinds of foods and, and habits and so on in order to reach for something more valuable, which is good health. The choice is always ours. And Paul says, it's not an issue of whether you're allowed to do it. It's a question of, is it going to be helpful for you? And is it going to control you? Or will you be a master over that thing in your life? The second thing about discipline, developing discipline, as we said at the very beginning, that the fruit of the Spirit is discipline, self-control, temperance, self-governing ability. A second way we develop discipline is by walking in the Spirit. Now, this term walking in the Spirit sometimes might seem very, very, you know, difficult to understand, you know, just floating in the Spirit, you know, I'm walking in the Spirit, spaced out. Now, it's not, it's not about that. To walk in the Spirit, Paul explains it to us in Galatians chapter 5 and also in Romans chapter 6 through 8. Basically, to walk in the Spirit means to live a life that is Spirit-controlled. It's under the influence and the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. He says in Galatians 5, verse 16, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not satisfy the desires of your flesh. So here's the answer. You want to keep your flesh in control? You want to keep your bodily desires in control? He says, walk in the Spirit. That's the answer. Walk yielded to the Holy Spirit. So you pray and say, Holy Spirit, today help me to walk yielded to you. And as you develop that ability, he says, you will not satisfy the desires of your flesh. In fact, he sums it up in Galatians 5.24. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and desires. If you're a Christian, this is the kind of person you are. You have crucified your flesh with its affections and desires. In Romans 8.13, and again he explains it. I'm just picking out one verse, one or two verses. Romans 8.13, he says, you know, if you by the Spirit crucify the deeds of your body, you will live. So by the Spirit, you're dealing with all the desires of your body. The Holy Spirit gives you the strength to do it. He he says in verse 26, the Holy Spirit himself helps us in our weaknesses. Romans 8, 26. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And he talks about how when we pray in the Spirit, that becomes an avenue for the Spirit to help us in our weaknesses. So the second area of discipline, second way we develop discipline is By just tapping into the strength of the Spirit. Just pray. Ask Him. Holy Spirit, help me to walk in the Spirit today. I've got a real issue with with this area of my life. And help me develop discipline in that area. And you will see the Holy Spirit will strengthen you in those areas. In that area of your life. Lastly, how do we develop discipline? It's by 
training and training and more training. You got to train yourself. There's no easy way. Don't come and say, Pastor, lay hands on me. Give me the anointing for discipline. Doesn't happen that way. You got to train, train, and train for you to develop discipline in your mind, in every area. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. I'd like, I'd like us to read this and we close here. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate. It's the same Greek word, is discipline, is self control. Everyone. Who, run, who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. See, they've got all areas of their lives, a life in discipline, under control. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So Paul says, look at the guys who compete, you know, this Commonwealth Games. And of course, in his time, you know, he was re- referring to, although the Roman government was in place during Paul's time, the Greek culture dominated. You know, the Bible history, first and foremost, there was the Egyptian Empire, then came the Babylonian Empire, then came the Persian Empire, then came the Greek Empire. And that was during the time Alexander the Great was one of the greatest uh, Greek emperors. And, and he, when Alexander the Great became, he was the second emperor, and he, when he established the Greek empire all over the world, he came to some parts of India as well. Wherever he went, he did two things. He established great colosseums. The Greeks were people who were just given to sports. And he also built great universities, libraries. They were very intellectual people. So two things that highlighted the Greek culture. And right after the Greek empire came the Roman empire, which is the time of Jesus and, and, and the New Testament. A lot of the Greek culture just continued through the New Testament. So in Paul's writings, you see a lot of reference to uh, things from the Greek culture. And one of them is this thing, this athletic things, uh, sporting events that was very dominant in those days. And so Paul is referring to that here. He says, you know, you know, all these people who run a race, they all run. Only one receives the prize. But all these guys who compete, they are disciplined in all areas, in all things, he says. And he says, but they do it for a perishable crown. I mean, you know, they stand the victory stand, they get a wreath put on their head, and then after a couple of days, all dries up. But he says, but we do it for an imperishable crown. The inference is, we must be disciplined in all things because we are running a greater race. We are going after an imperishable reward, an eternal reward. That's the sound from the stadium in Athens. All right. He says, we are running after, you know, this, this imperishable crown. And so we must be temperate, disciplined in all things. And he says, you know, I apply this to myself. He says, I keep my discipline, my body, and I keep it in subjection. Lest when I have preached to everyone else, I myself should, should fail. So we must learn to discipline ourselves in all things. I want to just give you some points here from a, a recent post on Harvard Business Review. This is not Christian, but it's useful. It's six keys to being excellent at anything. This person there are writing at Harvard Business, his name is Tony Schwartz, uh, and he's writing here six keys to being excellent at anything. And I'd like to share some uh, thoughts here, and it's, it's really interesting for us to understand these things. And of course, they are, uh, Tony Schwartz and others who are right here are people who work, deal with high performance. How do we help executives and other people in the workplace achieve high performance? And so he's writing here in this article, August 24th. He says, uh, we found in our work with executives of dozens of organizations that it's possible to build any given skill or capacity in the same systematic way We do a muscle. Push past your comfort zone and then rest. So saying, you know, we're working with top executives. What we found is that you can develop any capacity. All you've got to do is follow the same thing, same principle we do to build muscles. What do you do? Push past your comfort zone, take a break. Push past your comfort zone, take a break. And then he continues. He says, you know, he quotes Aristotle. He says, we are what we repeatedly do. And then he, he refers to another writer, Anders Ericsson. He's a world's leading, uh, leading researcher into high performance. And he says, Erickson has been making the case that it's not inherited talent 
which determines how good we become at something, but rather how hard we are willing to work. Something he calls deliberate practice. Numerous researchers now agree that 10,000 hours of such practice as the minimum necessary to achieve expertise in any complex domain. So Erickson's central findings is that practice is not, the, not only the most important ingredient in achieving excellence, but also the most difficult and the least intrinsically enjoyable. And then he talks about six ways to develop excellence. The point is this. The simple message is, if you and I practice, we can develop any skill or capacity. Deliberate practice. So you want to build spiritual strength? You need deliberate practice of waiting on the Lord. You want to discipline your mind. You want to have a mind that, can, that is renewed, that can think the way God thinks rather than the way the man thinks. You need deliberate practice to develop a renewed mind. Same thing with our bodies and same thing with the way we use our resources. It can be done. I want to invite us all to be willing to push past pain to arrive at the place of pleasure. Be willing to push past pain to arrive at the place of pleasure. The place where you really enjoy being and doing what God wants you to be. And there's great value to discipline. It impro improves your productivity, builds your self-esteem, and most importantly, helps you glorify God. Amen? Add to your faith, discipline, so that you can glorify God. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to take some time to pray right now. And this message is not intended to condemn us in any way, but just to encourage us to say, God, I want to be disciplined. Because Peter said, add to your faith, temperance, self-control, discipline, self-governing ability. It's a fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We cannot do anything about the past, about time that is already gone. But we can do something about the future. So there's no need to feel guilty about the past. I mean, just learn from the mistakes, that's all. But this morning as you stand here, I'd like us to pray before God and say, God, help me to develop, add to my faith, discipline. Discipline in my spiritual life. Discipline in my mental life, the way I think that I can put on the mind of Christ. Discipline in my body and discipline in my resources, the way I use what you've given me, God. I'm willing to think differently from this point on. I'm willing to walk in the Spirit, yielded to the Holy Spirit. And I'm willing, Lord, to train. Training may not always be easy, but I'm willing to press past the point of pain to arrive at the place of pleasure. Would you take a moment just to pray in your own heart this morning and just say, yes, Lord. I want to discipline myself. I want to be a man who would bring his being under control because such a man is greater than one who conquers a city. And such a man cannot be easily taken captive by anything else. Father, in this place, as we stand before you, we invite the Holy Spirit to help each one of us develop this fruit of the Spirit, self-control, discipline, or temperance in all things. To add to our faith, discipline. Let lives be changed with the strength of your word and with the help of the Holy Spirit. This morning as we pray, we'd, before we close, we'd just like to give an opportunity to anybody here this morning who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe it's your first time in church. or Maybe you've been coming to church, but you've never opened your heart and life to Jesus. I want you to pray a simple prayer. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creature. That's where everything starts. He becomes a new person. So if you will open up your heart and life to Jesus this moment and just say, Jesus, come in, make me a new person. He will do it. And this will be the beginning of your walk of faith. If you just pray that prayer right now before we close. In this place, you would say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Make me a new person. Help me to follow you, Jesus. That simple prayer could change everything in your life. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time in your presence. 
Lord, I speak your blessing over your people, saying, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening.